what complicated this was I, who had been cast in the role of the skeptic and the witness, had noticed that the moment he had forged the joint, as he called it, something began to happen for me, something very unusual. What it was was the teaching voice familiar from psilocybin experiences, but with none of the ambiguity and difficulty of connection that I had associated with the psilocybin experiences. Instead, it just came on and appeared to be locked in place. There was nothing but this voice, and it was talking at such a speed that I would walk these jungle trails like this. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, I see. yes, yes, and it was just you know, at that speed, not for minutes, but for months, you know. And, and what it was concerned to convey is what I now call the time wave. I was not an I Ching scholar, I was not a sinologist, I certainly was not a mathematician, but this inner prompting would give me no peace until I proceeded along this line to its conclusion. Well, I, of course, the bewildered recipient of this information, was trying to figure out, to get ahead of the game and say, you know, where is this headed? What is this thing trying to show me? And I decided it must be that what's happening here is I'm discovering an ancient Chinese calendar because you know, there are 64 hexagrams and six lines in each hexagram. That gives a grand total of 384 lines, or Yao. That's an interesting number. A lunation, a lunar cycle is 29 point something days. Anyway, 13 of them are 383.89 days. It's within a decimal fraction of 384. And I thought, aha, I'm sort of like the guy who decoded Stonehenge or something. This is, this is an agricultural calendar of 13 lunar cycles and from ancient China, apparently. And of course, the obvious objection from people was, uh, but what a lousy calendar. It slips 19 days per year against the sun. It's so. It's 19 days more than a solar year. But I think that there may have been a reason for that. You see, we in the West are static freaks, stability freaks. So we have a calendar that does not move against the fixed stars. The equinoctial and solsticeal points only move with the precession of the equinoxes, which is this very large cycle that you can't do anything about. But in an ordinary human life, it's hardly noticeable. It only moves one zodiacal sign every 2,000 years. So that tells you how slowly uh, it, it, uh, it moves. We are stability freaks. But if you had a calendar that precessed 19 days against the solar year, a lunar calendar, then you would have a calendar whose entire message was change, flux, flow. You would be born, if you were born at Christmas time and Christmas fell in winter at your birth, before you saw death at age 60, you would have celebrated Christmas in the springtime, at high summer, in early fall, in late fall. The entire sliding and slipping of the cosmic machinery would teach you a lesson the Western mind doesn't want to learn, which is, as Heraclitus said, pantit rea, all flows, all flows, nothing lasts. So I played with that for a while, and, and it was interesting, but I was not given peace by my muse, who said, no, no, this is... <laughs> Terence, this is stupid stuff. You know that poem by A. E. Hausman? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> there was more to it. And so finally I realized 
or I was told, treat your wave as though it were the lowest unit in a modular hierarchy that is structured the way the I Ching is structured. Okay, so that sounds arcane, but I'll explain what it means. It's fairly straightforward. It means take the, the wave with the 384 Yao, the 64 hexagrams running in two directions. And by the way, there are old sayings in the I Ching which say stuff like the forward running numbers refer to the past, the backward running numbers refer to the future. Well, in the I Ching as we have it today, there are neither forward nor backward running numbers. There are just numbers. So I had the confidence, aha, uh -huh, I'm like a noetic archaeologist with nut pick and toothbrush. I am reconstructing a crushed intellectual object, which if I can get it all cleaned off and going again, it will be, it's the original cuckoo clock or Ferrari or whatever it uh, was. Bear with me, we're almost over the top here. Uh, I took the little wave and I put six of them in a row to represent six lines. And then I took the wave and I magnified it by a power of three, so that it was three times bigger than it had been. And I laid two of those over my six to represent the two trigrams that are components of each hexagram. And then I took my original wave and I magnified it by a power of six. And I laid it over the six little ones over the two middle-sized ones, I laid one big one representing a hexagram in its unitary totality. Well, and I felt a great sense of satisfaction when this was all done, and these had all been generated from the same point. And now what I had at this point was an eight and a half foot long piece of paper, graph paper, covered with colored pen strokes. and tiny crab-like numbers, which I kept rolled in a bamboo tube, and I would corner people uh, in dime stores and bus stations, and I would say, you know what this is? This is a map of history. This is a picture of time. This is how things happen. Well, it triggered a lot of alarm in my immediate circle, and my friends were having the what should be done meetings, you know, <laughs> which it's always a bad sign when your friends hold meetings to decide what should be done. Uh, and finally, Ralph Abraham, who's a great friend and mathematician, Uh, he said to me, he said, you know what you have is an occult object. Nobody understands this thing but you. And it may make sense and it may, may not make sense, but the point is no one can tell. And what you have to do if you want to be taken seriously is you have to take this structure and you have to turn it into an ordinary mathematical object so that fellow uh, mathematicians can participate in this dialogue with you. Well, essentially, it was like telling a Hottentot to fly supersonically or something. I, I had no clue. I am I'm not a mathematician. I had no clue. And I was sort of hoping Ralph would do it for me, you know, that I could con some smart guy into doing it for me. For me, Terence is uh, a, a special person because of the breadth of his knowledge and the uh, evidence of a phenomenal integrity within it. So, first of all, when we first met, uh, Terence uh, was um, persistent in asking me about mathematics, kind of mathematics that I was interested in at, at that time that nobody else had even heard about, and as our relationship developed, I saw that he had this uh, philosophy of time, let's say, or maybe even mathematical model for the structure of time. That is an odd thing for a purpose, person to be 
obsessed with. And from this obsession, he had to learn a great deal about history. So in our process of trialoguing, we find it very much enriched by Terence's phenomenal knowledge of history, and not only that, but his special way of saying it. It's sort of, a, you're familiar with this here, a bardic skill, so that whatever he says will have more effect than it actually deserves. <laughs> It's almost as though Western science was fascinated by energy. For 5,000 years, we pursued understanding energy. And this process ends with thermal nuclear explosions in the deserts of the American Southwest. We can light the fire that burns in the heart of the distant stars. We know how to do that. That's what the Western mind achieved, political issues aside. The Eastern mind, was not interested in energy. It was interested in time. And they spent 5,000 years deconstructing it, looking at it, and you don't use atom smashers. You don't use enormous physical pressure. It's a different problem, and you bring different tools to bear. You meditate, you look inside yourself, you study the m movement of water around pebbles, you consider the situation, you study history. So the general conclusion from these screens is that novelty is being increased and conserved as we move through time. Now, for instance, in this screen, which is further closure with today, we see uh, 562 million years, virtually the entire career of higher life forms on the planet. 8,500 years on the screen, the great Proto-Egyptian civilization, Sumer, Ur, Chaldea, are strung out like pearls along this plunge. Egypt culminates that ancient hierarchical uh, form of dominator society. Mycenaean pirates plunder Minoan Crete. At this point, at this point, uh, here we have the Periclean Age in Athens. Here we have the Augustinian Age in Rome. Down here we have the Roman collapse and then the oscillating around a mean in a high novelty domain that has characterized time since the fall of the Roman Empire. The Dark Ages is here. Uh, the 10th century Islam is here. Uh, the Black Death, the discovery of America, the European Enlightenment, World War II. Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany, the atom bomb is dropped on Hiroshima, the summer of love is up here, then the Reagan era stretches down through here, and the moment that we're currently living through is right down in here. Uh, right there. Here we are. Right there, right, oh, right there. This is this bump we were looking at. Then there's a descent into novelty that reaches maximum on the 8th of July. And then there's this very steep and prolonged period of habituation. Now, if we look at the past, you can see how these numbers have now changed. Now, today is seen to be roughly in resonance with 745 A.D. <laughs> the French Revolution is down here, going here. Uh, this is the Franco-Prussian War, the American Civil War. Uh, the 20th century begins right there. And all, and Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany right there. Uh, the moon landing is right there. And then everything we've been living through has followed on since then. It means that, you know, any moment is a kind of interference pattern created by 
the moments in the past, many moments in the past. I mean, like this shows you, I think. Mm -hmm. This it's is so it's like synchronicities in a sense. Except that it explains them a different okay, way. Yeah, it replaces yeah. all that mumbo jumbo about mystery. synchronicity yeah, mystery, by yeah. saying, you know, this is just the inner penetration. Mm -hmm. of so the on past. the way here, we passed a restaurant called Maya Palinka. <laughs> yes, you passed it at a moment on the short scales when you were probably going through the classic Mayan bump. <laughs> and uh, if one is sensitive to this, a weird kind of psychedelic associationism begins to spread through reality, and it's no longer seen to be just the product of its own past casuistry, but that it has relationships to the past and the future that are not linear at all, but that are linked through this strange algorithm. Mm-hmm.